everyone. Thanks, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we have a pretty full house. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you Adam Bry, he's a, a co-founder and CEO of Skydio. D-I-O? Skydio, yeah. Skydio. Uh, and uh, before that he was at Project Ring at Google, one of the first people there, right? And then uh, he got his uh, SM from Aero Astro at uh, MIT and BS from Olin College. And he's a big radio flying fan and today he'll tell us all <coughs> their secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them maybe. Um, yeah, thank you Sebastian for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here today. I've obviously read uh, a lot of the research that's come out of CMU, but this is my first time actually being here, so it's exciting to, to be here and get to meet many of you. Um, so the natural tendency as a CEO when you get up to speak is to like pitch the company and oftentimes try to raise money, so I'll try to avoid uh, that. I'm actually excited today to have the chance to talk about a lot of the underlying technology and in particular talk about um, kind of the trajectory, um, some of it my own story, but the trajectory of research that started as a grad student at MIT uh, that led us to, to start the company. Um, so I think from a general consumer perspective, drones are a relatively new thing. Like I think they probably came onto most people's radar over the last three or four years um, and have been phenomenally popular. So depending on sort of how you break things down, there are probably between two and four million consumer drones um, sold last year. So there's a tremendous amount of excitement about the possibilities of what you can do with these things. Um, and people are starting to take all kinds of videos with them. So we picked some of our, our favorites off of YouTube. Um, the problem is that most of the videos <laughs> end like this. Um, so this is a fairly <laughs> common, yeah. This will get progressively more violent as we go along. <laughs> Finally, the, the sports one here. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it would have been good if like either the basketball or the drone had gone in the basket, but he was 0 for 2. Um, so this is pretty typical. Uh, and the basic paradigm for these things is it's a manually flown device. Um, so you hold joysticks. Um, you're sort of responsible for being the pilot. And if you're an expert, you can do incredible things. Um, but that's not the average customer experience. I mean, I think the average customer experience is somebody's excited to get their drone, they take it out of the box, and it pretty quickly runs into something. Um, if you look at Twitter on Christmas Day, you see a lot of this. Um, so if we're taking a step back and thinking about how we got here. So the first thing to recognize is that drones are not actually new over the last three or four years. I'm, I'm guessing people in this room are familiar with sort of the different technologies that are coming together. Um, but a lot of what we think of as a drone today really comes from RC toys, RC helicopters that have been around for 30 or 40 years and even longer. So in the upper left um, is what sort of a classic RC helicopter it would have a gas engine. It costs a few thousand dollars. Um, and there's maybe like tens of thousands of people around the world that care about it enough to, to tinker with these things. Um, and there's been kind of a series of, of technologies that have enabled what we today think of as a drone. So the first big one was lithium polymer batteries, which basically shifted propulsion from a finicky gas engine uh, to something that was much more reliable, smaller, lighter, cheaper. Um, and then MEMS, IMU, and GPS, and low-cost microcontrollers basically allowed us to push a lot of um, this mechanical complexity that comes into controlling a, multi or controlling a helicopter into software. Um, and you can use a multi-rotor where you basically have four moving parts. It's much simpler. It's much more reliable. Uh, and you just control it by varying the speeds of the motors. And then the last big one um, was just putting a camera on this. And it turns out like people had been dabbling with putting cameras on RC helicopters, but it never really caught on until the rest of the supporting pieces were in place. Um, but it turns out that a flying camera is just a phenomenally powerful thing um, that you can use for all kinds of, of different applications. You can do all kinds of interesting consumer video things, um, but inspection, monitoring, mapping, security, um, there's just so many applications where the ability to put a camera or put a sensor where you want, when you want, in, in move it in, in some kind of interesting, useful way, um, turns out to be, to be really valuable. 
Um, so I think that that's sort of like the, the super brief history of, of how the, the industry has developed. Um, and the opportunity that's out there and really the motivation for the company is very simple. We want to make drones smart enough to fly themselves with the same ability, awareness, um, and intention that an expert pilot would have. And if you can do that, I think you can start to make the incredible powerful of the platform available to people on a much broader scale. So it's a very simple idea. Um, it's just very difficult to deliver on. Uh, and I think there's, there's other things happening at the same time. But one of the exciting things uh, in the space right now is I, th I think like the research that's been ha happening in academia over the last 10, 20 years has matured to the point where it's possible to build real intelligent autonomous systems um, based on a lot of, a lot of the recent algorithms. Um, and at the same time, um, computers and sensors are sort of crossing that threshold where you can do it on a scale and at price points that make it make sense um, <laughs> to, to put in everybody's hands. So drones are like a very exciting, hot new technology. Um, and certainly in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of buzz about them. And there's people going after all kinds of different uh, applications and people sort of trying to clone existing products. Uh, but I really do believe it comes from a tremendous amount of, of opportunity in the space. And I think perhaps more with drones than any other tech, there's just an enormous gap between the kinds of concepts that people have in mind, like what you want to do with it. Oh, it would be awesome if I could have this thing follow me down the ski slopes and take a great video, or I could have it like map this space and what existing products are capable of. And I think closing that gap and using some, some core tech to deliver on the promise is, uh, is really the motivation for the company. Uh, so the rest of the talk, I'll kind of give you the, the trajectory of research um, that I've been fortunate to be a part of that, that sort of fed into to starting the company. Uh, so I can start with a little bit of my background. So I grew up flying radio controlled airplanes, which is how I got interested in this stuff. Um, so based on the picture in the upper left, you think it was taken in 1930 based on my hat. Uh, it was actually like 1990, maybe. Um, I'm not quite that old. I just, I guess, thought that was a cool hat when I was 10 years old. <laughs> um, so I, I built a bunch of these things growing up. I mean, I, from a, a very young age, just love stuff that, that flew. And I think it's really how I got interested in engineering and eventually interested in autonomous systems. Um, so the picture on the bottom right is a big, big uh, model airplane. It's p powered by a 150cc gas engine that I used to fly in competition aerobatics. Um, so you basically fly a set sequence of maneuvers, and you get judged on how precisely you could do it. So I spent a lot of time trying to become a good pilot myself. Um, but I think eventually sort of shifted my attention to trying to write software that could fly these things better than the best human pilots. Um, so that led me to be a grad student with Nick Roy at MIT in the Robust Robotics Group. So this was kind of my first introduction to autonomous flying systems. This probably looks very familiar to a lot of people in this room. So this is an Ascending Technologies <coughs> Pelican. Um, we had a bunch of different sensors on there. Um, but the main one that we used was the Hokuyo laser range scanner. Um, so this was like 2007, 2008 kind of time frame. Um, and the immediate challenge with this uh, was being able to fly indoors without the use of an external um, sensor system, so without GPS or without motion capture. Um, so the Hokuyo gives you a, a planar slice of the environment about 40 times a second. Um, and the immediate challenge is just being able to use that information to figure out your your motion. Um, so the, the core technology there was scan matching, um, which is basically you just line up subsequent scans. And if you can do that, you can figure out the relative pose transformation. You do that over time, and you can infer your odometry and relative motion. Um, and so that, that core piece, done well and done running on board the vehicle, enabled a large swath of autonomy. Um, so this is a video from the lab at about the same time. Um, and this is doing autonomous 2D exploration. So a lot of this research was basically once we had sort of solved the stability and control issues, you could bring over a lot of ground robotics research um, that was happening at around the same time. Um, and it's just sort of immediately applicable uh, and useful. So this is the, the Stata Center at MIT. Um, this was a much larger scale flight that we did in and around a bunch of different buildings. So the imagery there is overhead aerial imagery. But this was, uh, I think, a 20-minute flight covering a couple of kilometers, building up this kind of 3D point cloud. 
Uh, but this is basically like the upper limits of what you could do with this system. Um, and the severe limitation here is basically everything is making fairly conservative assumptions about the dynamics of the vehicle and also the environment that we're, we're operating in. Um, so it's based on kind of a two and a half D environment type assumption, assuming unaccelerated flight, so the vehicle's close to hover, um, which means the control and planning is, well, the planning in particular is much simpler. Um, it's basically like a holonomic system that you can just push around however you want. Um, and yeah, as a result, everything that the vehicle actually does is, is fairly conservative. Um, so my main vo motivation when I got to the lab was to see if we could push the boundaries um, of what these things could do. And to do that, we decided to just force ourselves. Um, so rather than using a quadcopter, uh, we decided we'd use a, a fixed-wing vehicle and see if we could deliver the same kinds of things, like flying in confined spaces in and around obstacles using only onboard sensors. Um, so this forces a number of algorithmic challenges. So in starting to think about what we were up against, the first piece is that we now have non-trivial and uncertain dynamics, uh, meaning our ability to predict, predict the evolution of the state over time is, is limited. Um, and there's kind of these hard, hard dynamic constraints in play. Um, the second <laughs> is uh, the, the sort of measurement uncertainty, because we're not going to use an external um, sensor system. We have to use onboard sensors to infer the state. And the availability of information becomes highly state dependent. So this is kind of a, a, toy, uh, a toy picture where, depending on where you are in the environment, you may or may not be able to see relevant features. But it's actually much higher dimensional than this, right? It depends on like the orientation and the velocity and everything of the, of the system. Um, so we came up with kind of a toy problem to help us think about this. Uh, so this is. Uh, just a 2D system where we have some initial um, initial state with some uncertainty around it represented by the blue circle. Uh, we have some goal region orange in the upper right and then we have some region where we can get information. So the sensor region we can get information about our state. Um, so we formulated this as a chance constrained optimization. So the goal is to get to the goal while bounding the probability of collision. Um, so if we try to go straight there because of the state uncertainty, uh, we're going to have some unacceptable probability of collision. Um, so a feasible solution would look something like this, where we go down, get some measurements, get the information we need, and then head back up to the goal. Um, we'd really like to do it in some kind of optimal way, like minimizing time or minimizing um, path length, cost, something like this. Um, so as inspiration, we looked. Um, to rapidly exploring random trees, so sampling-based motion planning, which I'm guessing a lot of people are familiar with. The basic idea is that you can, by randomly sampling the state space and connecting that to this tree that you're growing, uh, you can guarantee coverage. So these systems tend to be efficient in high dimensional spaces, um, but they don't reason inherently about uncertainty. And the, the difficult thing with uh, this partially observable system is that the information state is dependent upon the path that we take. So you can see in this example, we have two paths, A and B, that get us to the same intermediate state, but they get there with different uncertainty. Um, so if we go down and get measurements, we're going to have a tighter covariance. If we follow the, the blue path, um, we won't. And importantly, the, the information state that we get to at that intermediate point affects what we can do afterwards. Um, and so you have to store and sort of reason in this higher dimensional information space in order to guarantee completeness and even and have some notion of, of optimality with what you're doing. Um, so one of the observations here is that even though there's sort of this higher dimensional thing happening, we can impose, we can reason about what's going on there and use it to make the planning more efficient and in particular to restic restrict the set of paths that we care about. So the key idea is basically that <laughs> if you get to an intermediate point with lower uncertainty on all axes, that will hold no matter what you do after it. Um, this turns out to be just, just be a property of Kalman filter-like systems, the LQG systems. Um, and so that allows us to impose a partial ordering and prune most of the paths that we might otherwise have to explore <laughs> while, doing, while doing search. Um, so I'll show a visualization of the algorithm running. Um, so this is looking down from above in the kind of toy problem. And you can see it's incrementally sa sampling and incrementally searching and refining what it can do. And then we represent uncertainty here on Z. So it's not only exploring an X and Y, 
Um, it's also exploring in information space, and then it's importantly maintaining an optimal path to to every point that it uh, that it sampled. Um, so this was an interesting and sort of fun theoretical thing to go and work on. You know, we came up with an algorithm that had nice convergence properties. It was guaranteed to find an optimal solution. Um, but at the end of it, I ended up sort of thinking, so what? Um, because it didn't really feel like it got us much closer to being able to fly an airplane around in tight spaces, which was the original goal. Uh, and I think looking back on it now, this was kind of a turning point for me um, where I realized that for the kinds of things that I'm interested in doing, at least like being closely tied to the physical world and reasoning about real systems and doing things that like, uh, you know, really have, really can have an impact and animate the physical world in some way. Uh, is what I'm most excited about. And so I kind of hard switched and started coming about it from the opposite direction. So we built an experimental platform to test with. Uh, so this is a vehicle that I, I designed and built. We were in sort of a weird point in the design space. Like it needed to be something that could fly slow but carry a big payload and was fairly maneuverable. Um, so we built this custom vehicle. There was a little bit of like interesting design trade-offs that went into it. The most important design trade-off was not really an analytical thing, but uh, we anticipated that we would probably run into things. Uh, so we, <laughs> we put a bumper to protect the LiDAR, which was the most expensive piece of the system. And then the whole thing was essentially rubber banded together uh, so that if it hit something, it would uh, hopefully come apart rather than breaking. Fail very Exactly, yeah. Especially when you're the one that has to fix it. Um, so the first thing we did was went out and collected some data. So this was me flying manually. Uh, in a very confined space. This was like right at the limits of what I could do. It's probably a few centimeters from each of those columns every time I'm turning. And on the left, we have the, the laser scan data. Uh, and you can see that it's, it's very different from what a scan matcher is gonna wanna see. Like it's hitting the floor and the ceiling. Um, there's, you know, there's some information there, there's some features, uh, but it's not obvious like how you would, uh, how you would run like a traditional 2D algorithm against that. Um, so the immediate challenge to enable what we wanted to do was just the basic state estimation problem, trying to get the sixth off plus velocities uh, state estimate. Um, <clears throat> so the, the first caveat that I have to give here is we gave ourselves a known map. So we would pre-map these spaces, which is a significant leg up. I mean, it's probably better than using an external motion capture system, but it's still not fully generalizable. Um, and, and looking at the spectrum of what's possible, on the one hand, particle filtering you know, we know is good for laser-based localization. Um, however, common filtering is very efficient for higher dimensional systems, and in particular, the, the process step, the dynamics that you get with an IMU, we know are very amenable to common filtering. So the question is, can we come up with a, an algorithm that sort of uses the best of both worlds? Um, so the, the key insight that made this tractable was recognizing that we could use a particle filter essentially over the part of the state that we care about. Um, and the, well, the part of the state that the laser is likely to have information about, um, which in our case, we knew was gonna be some function of position and orientation. Like unless you model sort of the, uh, the motion over a single scan, which at the speeds we were going wasn't super significant, um, the information of a single scan basically only contains information about position and orientation, not velocity. Um, and so by partitioning the state space uh, and then using a particle filter to essentially extract an effective measurement and then pushing that back through the, the common filter machinery, we were able to get a system that was very, uh, very computationally efficient and able to run on board the vehicle uh, at about five hertz, which is as slow as we could reasonably get it to go um, and still work for, for flying at high speeds around obstacles. Um, so this is... Uh, a little bit of a experimental analysis that we did on this. So on the x-axis, we're looking at the number of particles, and then the y-axis is the fraction diverge. So we want that to be zero. Zero means that the algorithm's working the way we want it to. Um, and so the different lines are looking at different partitionings of the state space. And what we find is that with just looking at position, so position is the, the dark blue line, um, we can use about 20 times fewer particles than if we were sampling the entire state space. Um, so it's equivalent to about a, a 20x speed up. And this is not even including the process step. Like the process step with all the particles would add substantially to the, the computation, whereas with the common filter, it's, it's essentially no op computationally. Um, so running this uh, on the same data now, we can see that it's possible to extract 
um, really high quality, accurate, consistent state estimates. Um, so we show the trajectory that the vehicle is following, uh, and then uh, we're also reprojecting the scan so you can sort of see the structure of the environment. I forget, I'm actually looking at this now. So we were using, sorry, this is a very random aside. This was the, do you guys, when you guys do flying robots, do you do Z down or Z up? Z down, okay. So this was, like, I was still winning the arguments at this point. We were doing Z down, although everything since has been Z up. Um, yeah. So the next, the next challenge to enable what we were going after was really precise planning and control. Um, so one of the techniques that people commonly used for planning for fixed-wing vehicles is Dubin's curves, where you essentially plan using a set of line and arc primitives, and you can stitch these things together to get between arbor arbitrary points in space. Um, so they're very compact, represent, efficient, and they work pretty well if you're flying in a wide open space, like maybe outside using GPS, but the problem is that they don't actually represent the vehicle dynamics. So for an airplane, what is the, the curvature going to be proportional to? Be proportional to the bank angle, right? So a discontinuity in curvature um, is going to be a discontinuity in, in bank angle, which means that you're not actually going to be able to track this thing. Um, so here we have a simulation kind of showing that. But basically, when you get to these junctions, you start to deviate from the nominal path. And the more aggressive you're being, the worse these deviations are, are going to be. Um, so the the technique that we came up with was borrowing a lot of inspiration from what people were doing in, in quadcopters at the time. Actually, um, Nathan was involved in some of this. But basically, using polynomials uh, where you can map the derivatives of the trajectory to the inputs of the system. Um, and so we're, we're using uh, the Dubin's curves as like the underlying sort of bulk structure. And then we parameterize a one-dimensional polynomial offset from that underlying path. Um, and optimize the coefficients of that polynomial to enforce derivative continuity at the junctions um, so that we can get the smoothness that we care about and then optimize the coefficients to also minimize the maneuvering quantity, so to minimize the amount of energy that we're going to have to put in to follow the path. Uh, and it yields these kind of natural, nice effects where you can see, uh, like for this sort of S, we smoothly blend the effort before and after the junction. Um, and for this turn here, it sort of blends the as you exit the turn and then coming back onto the line. Um, so this was sort of the, the planning library that we gave ourselves. Um, so we put these two things together. Uh, and then after a fair amount of, of tuning and work and sort of bringing up the whole system, um, we got it working in, in some fairly confined spaces. So this is the parking garage under the Stata Center. Uh, we're flying at about 10 meters per second, 22 miles an hour. Um, and the system basically worked. I mean, we, I think our longest flight down there was about 10 minutes continuous. Um, so I think at the time, you know, we were just working on this stuff because it was fun, interesting. Like, we wanted to see if we could do it. Until we actually did that flight, we weren't quite sure if it was possible. Like the airplane had a two meter wingspan uh, and it was the parking garage was about two and a half meters floor to ceiling. So when it was banked over, there was almost no clearance. Um, but I think that the experience of being down, this was also at like 4 a.m. after the garage had emptied out and after a long night of like the final tweaks and tunes on the parameters. Um, but it was really a magical thing to get to see. Like this thing was just kind of floating around um, in a way that you would never be able to do as a person controlling it. Like I tried and I crashed every time. It's just there's not enough uh, room for a person to maneuver. Uh, and I think that that experience of getting to like getting to see this magical flying device was really one of the inspirations for for starting the company. And this was not something that we could share with anyone. Like this was, you know, we'd pre-mapped the space. We had carefully tuned up the system to work, um, and we're using a sensor that weighs a pound and costs five thousand dollars like it's not going to go to on, go on to a consumer product uh, but I think there's there's to me at least there's really something magical about this stuff and building systems that people can actually use and benefit with this kind of capability uh, I think is just a, a phenomenally cool thing to to get to do and so while all of this was going on this was about 2012 um, the world at large was starting to 
to get excited about drones. So these are some kind of example scenarios of, of things that, that you know, might be interesting to do with a flying camera. So on the left, um, this is on snow, but things are very, you know, they're commonly, people commonly build systems like this uh, with, with wheels for different kinds of, of Hollywood shoots. But basically we have a couple of tons of steel, a team of four people, and all of it is to move around an image sensor that could weigh a couple of grams. Um, so you could think there might be a more efficient way of doing that. In the center is somebody who's trying to inspect a bridge. Um, so he's climbed up to great heights. He's putting his life at risk to hold a mirror to reach around the underside to get a look at whatever bolt um, he cares about. And when you dig into this stuff, uh, it turns out a lot of these inspection jobs are so dangerous that you can't even get life insurance to do them. Um, and there's a lot of things out there where somebody basically goes and takes a picture or looks at something to, to validate it. Uh, and then finally, you know, everything that happens inside of a delivery warehouse is very efficient and automated, but everything that happens outside is still very manual. Um, and so it seems like there's some potential there. So this is, you know, after MIT and before starting Skydio, this is something that I spent a lot of time working on at Google. Um, Google and Amazon are, are both pushing on this. I think, you know, I tend to believe that the other two are likely to happen much faster and be more valuable in the short term because delivery essentially like rolls together all the hard problems in the space and it's a very high stakes thing. Like if you're carrying a five kilogram package, the vehicle weighs 20 or 30 kilograms. If something goes wrong, you don't want to be a part of that. Whereas if all you're carrying is an image sensor, um, reliability and robustness still matter, uh, but it's not, you know, it's not a life or death kind of thing, which I think is one of the exciting thing about these applications um, with drones is that it's, it feels like an area where autonomy can have enormous impact, um, but it's also kind of a lower stake space to play in where you can, you can push the state of the art, you can build like these magical cool autonomous products, and if something goes wrong, you can design them from a physical standpoint such that the worst case is kind of bounded and you're not gonna, you're not gonna seriously injure anybody. Um, so I'm gonna talk this is kind of like the reverse pitch. I'm going to talk about some of the, the technology that we're working on at Skydio. Um, we haven't announced what the product is yet, um, so we're uh, still early stage. You know, raised a Series A a couple of months ago to design and build the, the whole system. Um, you can tell from the kinds of videos I'm showing, like the kinds of things we're, we're going after. Um, so the input to the system uh, comes from a multi-camera array. So these are cameras that are spread around the vehicle. This is from a demo flight. And the first sort of bedrock problem is the same thing as before. It's always knowing where you are and how you're moving. Um, so we have an odometry pipeline that we've built up, um, similar to the kinds of things that, that you guys are probably seeing or familiar with. So we're tracking features over time in the images. Um, the key difference, well, not necessarily difference, but I think the unique thing about trying to do this as sort of like the foundation of the system is reliability and robustness are critical. Like it's not like we're trying to hit some performance result and show that we can do that. Like it really has to work all the time in every situation that you might want to use this thing in. Um, which I think, you know, the algorithm is still formulated in the same kind of way, but you have to be very careful about how you design it uh, and the kinds of like tools you use to validate it. So one of the things we put a lot of effort into is a system that allows us to automatically, anytime we make any change, run against a bunch of previous flight data and carefully monitor uh, the effect that that has. And it's the kind of thing that like, would be hard to get excited about building that system as a grad student. Uh, but once you have it, it turns out to be like a really powerful development lever. And there's things like that all over the system for what we're doing where you know, we have tools and infrastructure that we sort of wish we had as grad students but now make a lot of sense and we can pay people to develop because there's, like, there's clear benefits for the, for the product. Um, so another, another sort of module in the perception system is being able to track objects of interest. So this is the output of that. So this is a demo we gave to one of our investors. He's actually a board member now. This is Chris Dixon. Um, so we're using a lot of different signals here. I'll talk about one of them. So we're actually running something that sort of amounts to person slam. So we track features um, on the object over time um, and then use those to infer like the 3D structure and motion and position uh, of, the, of the object. So you can see the visualization of the drone here and then the, 
the person all happening in, in 3D in real time on board. So the output that we care about is the video. Um, so with just the camera strapped to the front. Uh, so the other, the other caveat I have to give here is all these videos are engineers, not athletes. Um, but we'll, you know, he got so excited he lost his phone. Um, so on the left is, the, uh, is the, the sort of static video. And then using the same high quality state estimate that we compute for control, we can um, extract this kind of nicely stabilized frame from it. I think there's some, so this is again our investor, there's some like baseball analogy to venture capital of like taking big swings. <laughs> so. Um, so I'll, I'll say a little bit about um, some of the motion planning algorithms that we've developed. Um, so this is visualization of the vehicle, just static sitting there. Um, and one of the things we're using is you can think of kind of like a maneuver library type approach. So at Hover, if we just consider all the different actions we can take, where an action is essentially like a combination of bank banking and applying some acceleration, um, you can look at sort of the, the coverage space that that takes you through. Uh, and then here we're sweeping the initial conditions. So this goes from hover to flying forward um, at five meters per second, maybe 10 meters per second. And you can see that now the like these, li these library elements tell us the kind of dynamic coverage that we can get over the environment. So if you're flying forward and you bank left, um, this is sort of the how you can expect the system to evolve. Um, so the reason that this is useful is it gives us a natural way to impose costs for different kinds of objectives. Um, so you can impose a cost that basically says go forward. And in fact, it works out pretty well if you just wrap a, a kind of like position control loop around this that always tells it to go in the direction that, that you want it to go for whatever the task is. Um, but importantly, it also allows us to incorporate uh, environment relative tasks. So it's very easy now to anticipate um, and do intelligent things when you're in and around obstacles, um, which kind of gets at the the video I showed at the beginning, like when you watch all those videos of the drones crashing, like watching the video, it's obvious it's going to happen. Um, and part of the argument is that we should be able to, to do something about it, like the drone should have that information on board. Um, I think that that is that just sort of barrier to environmental awareness and reacting intelligently um, is entirely absent from existing products. And I think that closing that gap is what's going to open up a lot of the most exciting opportunities. Um, so maybe one other difference between how we would do this in grad school and how we do it now uh, is rather than just going out to test it and see what happens, we have a pretty sophisticated full simulation stack that um, we run against. Um, so this is this poor Morse man who's like doomed to wander around ugly video game world with his arms out, Titanic style. Um, but it allows us to simulate the entire uh, perception, planning, control stack. Uh, automatically every time we change anything in the software um, and also in the loop as a development tool, um, which turns out again to be like a, a really powerful <coughs> thing um, for ensuring that the, the system is going to behave the way you want it to when you want it to. Um, so I'll, I'll show a couple of, of snippets of the kinds of capabilities that we have uh, operating in the real world. Again, software engineers, not athletes. Um, this is just videos from some of our testing. So this is all fully autonomous using computer vision to understand the world around it, know how it's moving, track the person, um, and then avoid obstacles all while trying to move in such a way that you can get good video of the person. So you can see it whip around the tree here. There's also the cloud of engineers following the thing down, curiously watching what's going to happen. Um, so we do have some athletes. So this is a demo we gave to Magic Johnson, who's an investor in the company, although we didn't have a Skydio shirt big enough for him, unfortunately, <laughs> at the time. Um, and it's pretty cool, like, yeah, sh showing the system to, these pe to people and seeing how they react to it. And in particular, with, with Magic, like, he's been around sports his entire life, and you could just instantly see his eyes light up of all the things you could do with this. Like, you could film practice and training and games from different ways and give athletes the way a tool to like document what they're doing and share it with their fans. Um, and the more of this we do, like the more we show it to people and get reactions, I think it's like, yeah, it's, there's like, there is something really cool uh, 
there's just something innately exciting to people about like a flying intelligent system that they get to interact with and use. I guess maybe he's lost a step since, <laughs> since then. Yeah, so he's controlling it there from the watch, although the tracking is all just done with vision. Yeah? Um, at what point would you decide that that's an important object to track? Because right now he's playing with the ball, but if he throws the ball, it might come into the path of the clock of the it. Yeah, so there's a couple of things in there. So. Uh, you probably notice he's wearing a blue shirt. So the thing that we initialize on is strongly based on color. So it was tracking him, not tracking the ball. Um, certainly being able to track the ball would be interesting. And I think one of the, you know, this is probably not a V1 thing for us, but you know, ultimately we're talking about a camera that is aware of the scene that it's looking at and has the ability to move itself through the world. And those two things together are incredibly powerful because you can start to automate a lot of the things that a person would do if they were holding a camera. So I think the like, you know, the ultimate product concept is essentially whatever you're doing, whatever sport you're playing or outdoor activity or just like playing in the backyard with your kids is you want it to be as if you had a professional film crew there filming it and like, you know, they would recognize that, oh, this is what's happening and here's how I could film that. Um, and all the information to do that is there. The algorithms that sit in between are challenging, um, but I think if we're successful with our first product, we'll start to be in a position where we have the data and the insight to enable these kinds of things. Um, so I'll show one other uh, video. So this is a demo we gave for uh, the NFL Players Association was in town. So this is a wide receiver, I think actually I think from the Bengals. So the, fir the first thing that a lot of them did is they wanted to take a video of the drone filming them, <laughs> which was not exactly what we anticipated. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, again, you can see this kind of cool thing where people don't know what to expect when it first takes off, and there's there's this like there's these few moments where they're sort of moving and they're seeing what it's going to do, uh, and it's reacting to them. Yeah, <laughs> more more of this like filming the robot that's filming you. He actually, so I don't think he knew it was filming him, and you can tell. So here he asks the question. Now he knows it's filming him. So, so now we get the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have the, the relevant sports ball here. Um, cool. So I think. So in terms of acknowledgment, so a lot of this work was done um, with Abe Backrack, who I've been working with for a bunch of years now. So he was my lab mate at MIT. We went to Google together. Uh, and then we, we started Skydio together. Um, he's in the John Deere sweatshirt there looking slick. Um, so this was the, the team at Skydio as of a few months ago. Um, and it's really an incredible group of people, I think, getting to work with these folks um, on a set of really interesting, challenging problems that feel like they have enormous potential <coughs> has been definitely the most exciting thing I've ever uh, gotten to be a part of. When I was at MIT, I spent a lot of, team on, a lot of time on the cycling team, which was fun. It was like a team-based activity with like a nice common goal. I also enjoyed research, but that was sort of like alone at your desk uh, off in Wonderland. And I think that in a lot of ways, the startup is like those two things put together. Um, I should also note, so Frank Dellert is a CMU alum. Um, Frank joined us as our chief scientist about a year ago. Uh, and at this point, I think we have pretty good coverage. We have folks from uh, UPenn, Stanford, UW, although no CMU yet. Um, so the possibility is still out there. Um, and we're also now uh, on the hardware side. Um, you know, we have a very, so Steve was leading product design of the iPad at a bunch of years. And we have a, a few folks from Tesla now as well. Uh, and I think. You know, the, the whole industry is still early, like as a company we're still early, but it feels like there's just, there's, you know, nobody has really put together like the right product elements in the right way and certainly with the right software. Autonomy in existing products is essentially entirely unexplored. Um, and I would happily bet on this group of people uh, over pretty much 
any other any other group out there anywhere in the world to, to make something really special happen. Um, so I want to thank everyone for, for having me, um, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, I noticed, uh, so many, many quality quadruples out there, uh, uh, a lot of the state estimation problem uh, could get difficult because of the changing lighting conditions. Yeah. So how do you deal with that uh, take? And the second question I had was, uh, uh, a lot of the failures that you showed uh, of like conventional drones was because uh, the obstacles were not necessarily in the field of view of the mm -hmm. vehicle by the first time. Maybe possibly the vehicle could have seen it earlier by the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, you've kind of like, seems like you've circumvented it by putting multiple cameras in there. Yeah. Uh, so is that going to be the, the final product or are you going to try and uh, you know, build up some uh, history of uh, observations? Yeah, so, so I, I guess, um, so the first question, so lighting is, is extremely challenging. Um, and it's not something that we can just fake. Like we have to, it has to work in a bunch of different scenarios. Um, and so I guess what I would say, like there are things that we can do because, you know, we have tight control over the cameras and the algorithms and we can use information from both simultaneously to, you know, for example, like if you know the exposure and you have like a good model of the properties of the sensor, um, you can start to actively anticipate and feed forward into the algorithms based on what's happening in the environment. Um, and things like that we found have had a, a very positive impact on performance and robustness. And then the other piece is that having cameras, having a bunch of cameras looking in different directions gives you a lot more robustness because the chances that some piece of the scene is well enough illuminated or reasonably enough illuminated to get the information you care about it are, are pretty good. Um, the, the second question, um, so I can't say like what the configuration of the final product will be, but it will have a bunch of cameras on it, for sure. Cameras are cheap. Like the image sensors cost, you know, a few dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're operating in unstructured environments, let's say people are using your drone to follow themselves and video And I'm assuming there's some other company, they also have their drone out doing the same thing. Yeah. How do you make sure that you don't pop into each other? Yeah. So this is, this is like the version of the future where like kids' soccer games are just like a cloud of drones overhead. Which I think that hopefully we can just have like one Skydio drone that's doing everything. Um, so I think there's definitely, you know, the air-to-air -air coordination problem is an interesting one. Um, and I know there's like people thinking about this in the research community. There's also a couple of companies that are, are looking at it. I mean, certainly, like, I think visual intelligence still has something to say here. Like, usually you can see issues and collisions coming and do something about it. Um, so I think that, like, similar kinds of solutions are, are possible. Um, for V1, I would say that's not something that we're going to explicitly address. So we'll, we'll wait until they're, well, we'll try to, roll that out just before we're like fully populated the world with our drones. But, yeah. Yeah. So when you're tracking, is there anything specific about, I mean, I'm saying is if you have a people tracker or just a anything tracker? Yeah, so I, I can't say, I mean, we're, we're using a bunch of different signals. Um, we're using, you know, some machine learning stuff. We're using some like hand trained, hand tuned stuff. Um, I think that Ultimately, like being able to generically track anything is more interesting and more powerful. There's a lot of things you can enable with that. Um, so that's that's our long-term focus. And the other thing, there's you know we found there's a lot of nice things that happen when you build a complete system together. Like because the tracker is operating in an environment where we have like really good state estimates, we have a really good 3D understanding of the world. Um, you can start to bring to bear a lot of that kind of information to make the system more reliable in a way that, and even, I mean, there's interesting algorithms that only make sense once you have sort of those building blocks in a way that you can't do, you know, just sort of a generic like 2D image track something, I think is a harder problem. Um, or there's at least less information at your disposal than what, than what we have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
so it seems like from based on the video when you were moving around in the world, uh, it didn't seem like a 3D reconstruction was the real intent there. All you required was like some sort of stable parametry estimate. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, is that something that you're trying to do as well? Yeah, so I, d I didn't show everything that we're doing, I guess what I'd say. But you can, yeah, there's a lot of other, there's a lot of pieces to the, the perception pipeline. Um, and obstacle avoidance, I think, is one of the, like, the critical things. I mean, there's people talking about like, similar kinds of products. Like if you look on Kickstarter, people have done pre-sales for like, this kind of thing. I th in my mind, the product doesn't really make sense until you can not run into stuff, <laughs> right? Like it, not running into stuff is a very hard problem, so you can't blame people for not trying. Uh, but I think that that's sort of the starting point for this to really make sense as a category. Yeah? Is there anything additional that the watch does uh, other than like, you know, controlling it? Do you use it as an additional beacon? So, so there's a lot of things it could do. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry. Yeah. I was really curious on, um, you know, you mentioned oh, you know, it's a great array of centers for real cheap. My understanding is that you know, computer vision optimized global shutter camera arrays are a very boutique, expensive sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, so there, it's interesting. So there are, there are definitely some like very cheap, pretty good parts out there that you can use. I think that the whole, like the sensor, you know, the camera sensor companies have realized that there's a lot of opportunity here now. And so if you look at all their, you know, when we go in to meet with them, they'll show you sort of like their product roadmaps. Like down the roadmap, you know, they're, they're definitely starting to understand that like high resolution, high dynamic range, global shutter things are going to be important for drones and for cars. Um, so I think that there will be, over the next five years, there's going to be a lot more availability of that. I think there's enough now to get a reasonable start, but the picture there is, is definitely getting better. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, what, what do you see for the end product is for in terms of user portability? Yeah, so um, I think it's critical, really. Like the, I think one of the biggest barriers to using existing products is that it's like hard to take it with you. Um, so it's something that we definitely think about, uh, and our design is built around. I mean, this is this is not stuff that I talked about today, but. You, you can see it happening now. I'm super excited about the product that's coming down the pipeline. Like nobody, if you just if you look at the kind of design that goes into a piece of state of the art consumer electronics, and you look at an off the shelf drone from today, there's an enormous gap there, and a lot of the like really high quality engineering thinking and design has not been brought to bear. Um, so we have folks from Apple and Tesla now that know how to do these things and are applying that same kind of design thinking to a drone, which I think is going to be a pretty pretty exciting thing. Yeah. Are you using the same trajectory planner that you uh, implemented on the fixed wing for this idea? Uh, no, so it's a lot of the same ideas. Like a lot of what we learn there is relevant, but it's a different, um, <coughs> yeah. Because we don't, we don't have the fixed wing constraint, we can get away with essentially uh, like generic polynomials. So the ideas are the same. Yeah. Yeah. So all the perception that you showed here seem very low level. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering, uh, have you looked at using semantics to, to add more intelligence to those the way to go? So that's a that's a great question. So we've definitely looked at it. I think that that is that's one of the most exciting long-term opportunities because there's just kind of like no limit to what you can do there, right? Like the images contain a huge amount of information about the scene. And you can start to extract that in more and more sophisticated ways to inform what the thing should do. And you can build on top of what's already like a robust navigation system. Um, so uh, I expect that we'll be working on that for a long time to come. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if you could say something about uh, liability. You're selling drones, you're quite close to people, you worry about and taking out somebody's eye, and if so, who do you hold responsible? You know, do you think you can carry the liability as a company, or the person who's going to operate this thing just flying? You know, that, that, that video was very impressive, where it's flying, um, chasing those bicyclists down the trail, but it was probably no more than four or five feet away from some of the bicyclists, it looked like it. Yeah. Flying that close, anything could happen. Yeah, so that's a, 
That's a really important question. I think the first thing I would say is forgetting about liability and like who's responsible. Like certainly we want to build the safest possible product, right? So that form factor of the vehicle you saw is not what the final product will be. And from a physical standpoint, we want to make something that's as safe as it can be, which in most situations just kind of boils down to like size and weight. Like size and weight put, you know, that determines how much energy you're putting into the propellers. It determines how much energy the thing carries when it's flying. Um, so minimizing those two things is important. Beyond that, I think, you know, our software is pretty clearly aimed at <coughs> increasing sort of reliability and safety of the system. Like we're trying to get away from this like manually flown kind of crash happy thing. I think that the, you know, the liability associated with autonomous systems is in general kind of an amorphous thing right now. I think it's, it's probably a bigger issue for self-driving cars where it's like literally life and death stakes every time the thing takes an action. Um, with drones, I think it's not quite at that level, um, but certainly like, yeah, it's, it's important. I don't think the answers are certain. The, the things that we can control is we can build as good a product and as safe a product as we can, and then we can tell the story to the customer of like, here's what this thing's capable of, here's what it's not, here's how you should use it, and here's how you shouldn't. Um, and make sure that we, we communicate that clearly and effectively. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, a, it's an open issue. Yeah? Uh, this is a little more trivial question. How hackable would you find for that? <laughs> you want to hack it? Yeah. yeah you, you, you come, what? Right, if you could just you know, work on top of something that's got good state Yeah. Uh, so, sir, yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree. I think the, you know, our whole focus right now is on building a really good product. Um, and there's, there's a lot of things you could do around that and on top of that that we're interested in enabling. But, you know, with like an 18 person startup with X amount of runway and venture capital, like there's only so wide you can afford to be in your focus. But I think, yeah, I, I, enabling people to build on top of and do interesting things with it, I agree with you, would be, would be super cool. Yeah. When can I buy one? <laughs> so we're not announcing when we're going to announce it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, look, like I mean, we're on a you know we're on a startup type time horizon, so it's not going to be years. Yeah. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about applications so far early on, and you're doing practice video events in the short term. But is there anything interesting, particularly for you, long term? Um, so I think there's, you know, there's different time horizons you can think on here. I think that the like, if you just ask the question to a bunch of different companies of like, what would you do if you could put a sensor anywhere you wanted at any time you wanted, any you know, without a person needing to be there to control it? Like, I think there's a million answers to that, and that's going to take fully exploring and enabling all of that. I think is a five, ten, fifteen year type of thing and each, you know, some of them are, are probably going to fall into different categories or like different verticals and different kinds of products. I think there will be like a lot of shared technology between, between all of them. Um, and I, I think the other perhaps like, you know, this is not something we actively think about, talk about, work on, but the whole aerospace industry right now tends to be, you know, aerospace products today are owned by the military, by airlines, and by extremely <laughs> wealthy individuals. Um, and I think that with things like this, that's going to change. Like aerospace products, cutting really cutting edge aerospace products will be available for much cheaper um, for a different set of applications. And I, it's hard to say exactly where that's going to go, but I think um, you can imagine it powering a lot of different kinds of things. Like flying cars are kind of an obvious you know, at some point, like personal flying transportation will become a thing. I think it's, people are sort of working on that now. It, in my view, it's more likely to grow out of, um, out of sort of drone technology than anything else, where you can deploy on a large scale and you can validate that this stuff actually works. You had um, the video at the beginning, or the picture at the beginning of like the bridge inspection. It seemed like it could be potentially a very lucrative market if these are very high value they're used to do this right now. Mm -hmm. Do you decide to do more consumer rather than particular industrial application because of 
thought it'd be more fun, or because you thought the value was, was higher there? Uh, so we definitely thought it would be more fun. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, as I, I think a lot of the excitement for us is like building the system that everybody gets to use, and not everybody, but that is like available and, and useful for a lot of people. Um, I certainly think that the there are a lot of industrial applications out there, and there's a lot of value that can be provided, and it's going to be. I think there's like sort of. A, ecosystem development thing that needs to happen where like companies need to get used to work using drones as part of their workflow they need to get used to like using the data that comes from them which is going to be different maybe from the data that they're used to getting um, and so that stuff I believe will happen I think it's just going to like it's going to spool up um, and it, think of, like regulation challenges or something that steered you away from that right now uh, yeah I mean it was like all things considered, like we had those opportunities. There were certainly companies that were interested in doing inspection and monitoring type stuff, um, but we felt like it wasn't it wasn't what we were the most excited about, and it also didn't seem like the uh, best sort of long term way to go. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the robustness? Well, that's going to be a big aspect, right? If you don't have uh, you lose your state for a second, you know, you, for the happen flight or something like that. So something, <coughs> so yeah. you see contingencies and robustness and like that. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, I mean, it's clearly very important. I think it, to me, robustness comes from like really carefully thinking at the system level and design like for each component of the system and the system as a whole, like what can go wrong, what's that going to look like, and how can we like test in these different scenarios and understand it and, and do something about it. So I think the answer is kind of similar that like the, by making a small lightweight thing, you can kind of hard bound the worst case scenario, right? You still don't want to have a crash or have something go wrong, but even if it does, it's not going to be, it's not going to be catastrophic for a person or, or property. Um, yeah, I don't think there's like a magic bullet to robustness beyond like being careful and thoughtful in the design and making sure that you test and validate these things. I mean, there are some kind of known <coughs> failure cases, right, for using these methods, right? So yeah. if you have, you know, visual geometry, you will crap out at some point. Mm -hmm. right? If you're flying in the canyon with bad GPS or something like that. Yeah. Now you, now you lose your state, so what do you do? Do you turn on the props and fall down? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, there are things, I mean, you can do, there are like varying levels that you can fall back on, right? Like attitude. Right, right. So yeah. That's what I was yeah, yeah. So those no, kinds. But if you go back to attitude, now your user has to start flying. Or you can descend and land. There's actually like an interesting category of videos out there. So drones, I mean, I, I guess I would sort of say like whatever we do, it's probably going to be way better than what's on existing products. Like a lot of drones today have a return to home feature where if you lose link or something, it'll like come back and auto land, but it's just like totally blind based on GPS. So a lot of crashes actually happen when the thing tries to do that. And the, my favorite class of videos is like when somebody's flying next to a body of water. Have you seen this? And it'll like, it'll start to auto land into the water. And so there's great videos of people like running and like swimming out to catch the thing and then like grabbing it out of the waves as it's, <laughs> it's, as it's coming down. Yes. Yeah. Um, you were talking about the product narrative earlier. Um, you made a pretty compelling case for sports. Is there any other major use case in your post uh, <coughs> In which, like in kind of consumer video? Yeah, in, yeah. In, what, in, in your market, other than, other than sports, there's something Well, so I think, I mean, sports is a pretty broad, like sports covers everything, I think, from like an extreme skier and skateboarder to like playing in the backyard with your kids, <laughs> right? And I think the like the core thing of you want to capture some event, some important event for whoever the user is in an interesting, cool way, I think is pretty general. Like some of it you might call sports, like is, Hiking with your kids' sports, maybe, um, but it's certainly something that, like, in a nice area, you can imagine getting an amazing video of that you wouldn't otherwise be able be able to get. Um, there's there's a lot of other 
Yeah, I mean anything that you would like video, right? Like people use GoPros for documentation, just like what happened when I did this. Um, I think there's there's probably a lot of parallels for this as well, but I mean partially we'll have to. I would imagine you know if history is any indication, like there will probably be a lot of cat videos of like <laughs> <laughs> following your pet around and seeing what that looks like. Yeah. 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 Um, so you mentioned that your tracker was like mostly color based. So like, <laughs> what if you were trying to track like multiple objects? Uh, multiple objects of the same color or something? Or? Maybe different colors, but then, you know, if, it seems like if, if it's only color-based, then <laughs> well, so another I, person wearing a blue sure. shirt would definitely lose your state. Yeah, so color is uh, one of the things that we initialize on. We're doing a lot of different stuff, not all of which is color-dependent, and certainly the goal is to be completely, you just, like, adapt to whatever you need to. Um, cool. So I guess the, the last thing I say is we are, um, you know, we are actively um, looking to, to grow the team. So if anything about this seems interesting to you, my email's up there. Um, I'd, I'd love, to, love to hear from people. Okay. Let's pick those All right. Thank you.